From Hollywood, the CBS Radio Workshop. When I was the Duke. You yeah. know, the Duke had to be the baddest one, you yeah. know, and I was the Duke, see? And if anybody wanted to get in the gang and they thought they could whip me, well, then they could be Duke, see? CBS Radio presents the CBS Radio Workshop, dedicated to man's imagination, the theater of the mind. William Keneally speaking. You're about to hear an experiment in communication. Communication between a juvenile delinquent and you. The experiment, your reaction. Unless you are a law enforcement officer, a social worker, or a criminal yourself, your knowledge of crime is pretty much limited to what you read in the newspapers. And with each new outburst of hoodlumism, each new outrage against public decency, you, the law-abiding citizen, probably cluck in dismay, murmur that something should be done about it, and turn to the sports or the society page. We, too, think something should be done about it, and perhaps the first thing might be for the law-abiding citizen to meet the criminal. Only, chances are, he wouldn't talk to you. He couldn't talk to you because you don't talk the same language and because he doesn't trust you. But he'll talk to another criminal. He'll relax with a fellow ex-con. He has, in what you're about to hear. The boy we call Bobby, alias the Duke, and the man who interviews him are friends. They serve time together in San Quentin Penitentiary. The interviewer for forgery. Bobby for Grand Theft Auto. For obvious reasons, their real identities are withheld. But their words come to you with their full knowledge and consent. Because, you see, they too think something should be done about it. Especially Bobby, alias the Duke, who at the age of 23 has already served 10 years of his life in Los Angeles Juvenile Hall, Sheriff's Office Camp 5, the Preston School of Correction, and San Quentin Prison twice. Here's the Duke's story in his own words. How old were you when you first was they got in trouble? Well, I don't know. I guess I was around 10, 10 or 11, something like that. Mm -hmm. What was the kind of trouble you into? Well, see, in my neighborhood down there, why, it was during wartime, and all the broads were knocked up, you know, and all yeah. men were overseeing everything, and nobody had much money, you know, living on government mm -hmm. pensions. And, yeah. So we used to go into the markets and stuff, and we used to steal butter and things like that, you know. Yeah. We used to sell it to the people in the neighborhood, see? Mm -hmm. Well, they know you were stolen, you think? Well, yeah, man. I mean, we used to sell a pound of butter for almost nothing they had, to yeah. you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, like I say, we sold it all the time, and this this old lady, we used to sell it to her, too, you know? Yeah. So one day she buys about, I don't know, a pound, two pounds, something like that. And the first thing you know, the cops are out rousting us. Oh? Yeah, she, what happened? She turned in? Yeah, man. After she bought the pound or two pounds of butter, whatever she bought, well, then she turns us in, you see. But, I mean, she waited till she bought it, you see. Yeah. What did the cops say to you? Well, you know, they give us this bit about, uh, you know, we're going to send you up and all this, and uh, you can't go into supermarkets and steal, and the manager's pressing charges and all mm. this shit, you know. Did they take you home? Well, you see, at the time, my mother and father were down in San Diego, and so mm -hmm. they had to wait till they get back from the weekend, you see. What happened when they got back? Well, you know, my other, my mother was very understanding, you know what I mean? Yeah. And, uh, but my old man, he was, uh, well, he was he was just an asshole. That's all there was to it. I mean, did he play a big part when he... Oh, yeah, you know, the, the fuzz tells him, they say, uh, well, I'm going to leave these boys to you now. You you take them home and you take care of them, see? I mm -hmm. mean, it's almost like giving them written permission to kill us, you know <laughs> what I mean? What did he do? What, what did he do when he took you home? Well, man, we, we got home, you know, and, and the old lady was sort of blubbering, you know, and everything. Yeah. And, and the old man says, uh... Oh, you goddamn hoodlums, and wham, he hits this one, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and then he takes off his belt, and he starts beating us with it, you know. And only beats us with a buckle end, you know, and he cut us up mm -hmm. pretty bad. So after he gets tired of that game, he lays down on the couch, you see, and he's sleeping yeah. a while, you know. Mm -hmm. So me and my brother, we go in the bedroom, we pick up this little baseball bat they'd bought us, you know, yeah. about three foot long, something like that. And I hit him right in the head with a wham, as hard <laughs> as I could, you know what yeah. I mean? So then he gets up, you see. Mm -hmm. And for our punishment, I mean, after he belt us around a while, he takes us out in the front lawn, and he makes us mow the lawn. It's about 2 in the morning. We're mowing the lawn yeah. from 2 till about 4.30, you see? Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, that's his that's idea. idea. Yeah. You heard the old story, like, uh, there's a right and there's a wrong, and then there was his way, you see <laughs> yeah. what I mean? Yeah, yeah and that was all there was to it. Well, do you, ever, do you ever feel your hate towards him influence in your trouble you had? I mean, did that cause you to go out and raise hell? Anything? Yeah, because a lot of time I run against people that were just exactly like him, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, run across cops that were like him, you know. Yeah. They were always right, you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. and, and I run across different type of people, you know, teachers and so forth. And it was the same type, you know. I... The dad Bobby refers to was actually his stepfather, 
but that made little difference to a boy of 10 who found that the hostile world began in his own home. He was the only dad Bobby ever knew. And how about mother? The psychologist calls this kind of attitude ambivalence. Well, I don't know what the hell was the matter with the old lady. I guess after my old man died, she sort of just went goofy or something because... Mm -hmm. To marry, you know, to stay with that jackpot for as long as she did, I don't understand it at all. Listen, listen, I always had all the love and everything in the world. I mean, my mother always loved me. I mean, she wasn't home all the time to love me, you know what I mean? But, yeah. I mean, she loved me. Did you never buy anything when you were a kid, a uh, bicycle or anything like that? Or? No, man, all he ever bought me was trouble, that's all. She wasn't home all the time to love me. He belts us with the buckle end. Such was Bobby's home sweet home. So what about the other side of a young boy's world, school? What would you expect? Well, I didn't stay in school very long, so I didn't do too what well. Well, did they kick you out of school or what? Yeah, well, they had a teacher in school, and it was a lady teacher. Her name was Miss Pendergast, eh? Yeah. Well, we used to call her Miss Pain in the Ash, you know? <laughs> oh, yeah? So one morning, I'm walking down the hall, see, and I say to her, I say, good morning, Mrs. Pendergast, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, and I sort of, you know, say it fast and sort of slur it like, you see? Yeah. Like, uh, like maybe it sounds like Miss Pain in the Ash, mm -hmm. you see? So she says, well, well, she says, there's the other half of the Hoodlum Brothers, you know. Yeah. Well, I mean, so I belted her. You see what I mean? You hit her? Yeah, but yeah. I mean, you know, my mother always told me, I mean, we didn't have to take that from anybody, you know what I mean? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So then the vice principal calls me down to the office and tells me what I am and what I ain't and so forth. And he uh -huh. kicks me out of school. Well, I mean, I told him. Yeah. I told him, I said, listen, what kind of a teacher is that that calls you the other half of the Hoodlum Brothers, huh? Mm -hmm. I mean, she couldn't say good morning, Bobby. She has to say something yeah. like that. You see what I mean? Crazy, mixed-up kid? <laughs> you bet he was. But if they wouldn't teach him at home, and they couldn't teach him at school, there was another institution of learning, the streets. You any gangs in? Yeah, we had what they call the Louis Street Boys, see? How was that? And uh, it, was a, it was a gang of us kids in the neighborhood, you know. And was that during the war? Or yeah. The war? yeah. Mm -hmm. And I was the Duke. Yeah. Know, the Duke had to be the baddest one, you yeah. know, and I was the Duke, see? Did you, did you enjoy that kind of position? Yeah, man, I mean, I had a lot of prestige, yeah. you know. I mean, if anybody wanted to get in the gang and they thought they could whip me, well, then they could be Duke, see? Would you boys fight the war right there in the... Yeah, man, we used <laughs> to have a ball there, you know. We had a lot of guineas in our neighborhood, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, so we had this one, Desale was his name, and, and he yeah. used to belong to what they called the Butcher Boys, see? Oh, yeah? So they gather on one side of the street, he was Mussolini's cousin or something, you know? <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah, he really yeah. was. And he used, to, he used to stand on a fence with all his boys around him, you know, and mm -hmm. he used to say, Viva la Mussolini, see? So we'd st I'd stand across the street, you know, with my boys, and I'd say, Mussolini, you know? Yeah. And we'd charge him, see? <laughs> yeah, we'd meet him right in the middle of the street, you know. How you, how you proved yourself during the war? And... Yeah, man. Well, I mean, we kicked the shit on them boys, you can believe that. <laughs> you felt that was, that was your way of showing that you were... Sure, that's the right. Then I was the Duke, see, you know? Yeah. And, well, uh, in other words, uh, as far as your life, the sort of life you led then, that you didn't feel any special shame about it or uh, any guilt or any... No, man, Feeling? because I couldn't, you see. I mean, I, I was the leader. I had to, I had to be it, you What well, the kids you led? I mean, did uh, you ever find kids there that you thought didn't belong? I mean, did you ever feel that you like to tell a kid don't get in this kind of life? Or did you try to tell a kid to stay away from this no, kind No, man, hell no. There was nothing mm -hmm. matter with that. I mean, uh, I used to take care of my boys, you know what yeah. I mean? And what what they learned they, it was for their own good. I mean, mm -hmm. right today, I bet they don't regret it. You see? Mm -hmm. uh, did you have any real bad trouble with Mexico? What happened yeah, that was, that was when I got the 12 stitches in my head. Well, that? See, we had Annex 1, 2, and 3, you know, and, and the whites and different people yeah. used to live in 1, and Mexicans in 2, and mm -hmm. the colored people lived in 3, you see? So, we used to go over 2, it wasn't so crowded, and we'd play pool over there, you know? Yeah. It's what they call the recreation hall, you see? Recreation yeah. hall, yeah. What happened here? Well, the recreation hall, that's where we used to get our marijuana and stuff, you know? You smoke it? You smoke that stuff? Yeah, well, not too much, because it made me sick a lot, you know? Oh, would you feel to have it for me? Marijuana? Mm -hmm. No, man, marijuana itself isn't it. You go for marijuana, you want a bigger kick scene, then you go on the horse or something, you know. Hey, you're going there, stuff? No, man, I never tried horse, huh? I couldn't see the main line. Yeah. Well, you mentioned once a long time ago this rough view they had there with the Mexicans. You had some rough times over there, the pool always. Yeah, I were over there one day playing pool on a back table, see? Yeah. And all of a sudden, these three or four Mexicans come in, they, and I'm about to shoot a shot, and this one grabs me and says, you've been playing long enough, you know? So I says, well, go piss up a rope, Dad, and when I'm tired of playing, yeah. then I'll tell you, you know? Mm -hmm. So he says, uh... He says, just cut out, you know, he tells me, you know. And I say, you know, I tell him, well, yeah. go to hell, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So he just stands there saying, you know, he's got these badasses behind him, you know. So my buddy says, well, maybe he don't understand English, you know. So he says, you tell him in Mexican, see. Mm -hmm. So I tell him, I say, uh, Pala Malavetica, you know, means like, mm -hmm. uh, like shove off asshole or something yeah. like that, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So then they take off, see. So we play a couple more games, you know. 
And right as you walk out the door into the yard, you know, you hang yeah. up your pool stick, see? And man, I look out the door, and there's about six or seven of them out there, see? Yeah. So I thought, we ain't got one out, you know, and I used to get out in the yard and maybe get some help, see, from the rest yeah. of the gringos, you know? Mm -hmm. And so they got a big fence there, you know, where this guy used to keep his bottles and stuff in, you know, so we couldn't steal them. Yeah. And I figured if we get our back to the fence, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Why then, see, we'll be all right, you know. Well, the last thing I remember, I was running for the fence, you know, and I it's hit a couple late. of them with a pool stick and... And one I'm, got you, huh? Yeah, in the back of the head, yeah. What's happened? Did you take the hospital? Yeah, man, I had 12 stitches in my head. And I, How do you folks feel about that? Well, I don't know, but when I woke up in the hospital, there was my buddy laying beside me. He <laughs> was cut up something awful, man. What's your folks, how they feel about it? Did your dad feel sorry for you finally? Did you hear you all banged up? Yeah, he felt sorry for me. I'll tell you how he felt sorry <laughs> for me. See, that after they, they bandaged me up, my head was all, all yeah. wrapped up in gauze and stuff, you know. And so they come and got us, and they took us home, you know. So right away, he starts the same shit, you know, the, the little hoodlum action, yeah. you know. So he starts hitting me. Oh, I mean, I got 12 stitches in my head, and he's belting me around. He don't hit me in the head, of course, you know. I mean, you know, he's a big hard and thing. What'd you tell him? Uh, did you try to defend yourself? Did you tell yeah, him you were trying man, to defend yourself? I told him. I told him what happened. And he says, well, you got no right over there anyway. You should be home soon. So yeah, you were wrong in spite of all that, huh? Yeah, I mean, I'm wrong in defending myself. Have you ever seen him since? No, no. If I ever see him again, man, I'll, I'll have to go back for a long time, you see, because I'll kill him, yeah. Gang fights, marijuana, this is kid stuff. There's a lot more for a growing boy to learn. And there are schools where skills could be quickly acquired and lessons learned that last a lifetime. There's the Preston School of Correction. Oh, man, Preston, you know, it wasn't like a grade school or nothing, you know yeah. what I mean? And they got a lot of guys there that you're supposed to only be 20 or 21 while they were 29, you know, yeah. 20. Was so, it pretty rough there? Sure, it was rough, man. Like the first day I'm in, you know, I get my ward and I go down and hit the sack, see? Mm -hmm. And so I'm laying there straight in my sack away and. This guy comes over and he pats me on the ass, you know, and he says, uh, he says, well, well, he says, a tender fish, you know? Yeah. So I says, listen, man, just keep your hands off me, I says. Mm -hmm. And he says, oh, he says, a badass, you see? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I had to prove myself right then, you see mm -hmm. what I mean? Because if I didn't, the whole rest of the time that I'm there, I have nothing but bullshit, you see what I mean? I know. So I kicked him in the nuts, see? Mm -hmm. And he went down, and when he did, I booted him in the head a couple times. You see? And from then on out, no trouble at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You feel Preston helped you anyway? Did, uh, I mean, if, uh, it's called the Preston School of Correction. Yeah. Correct you? Yeah, it taught me one thing, man. It taught me that uh, that I once again was Duke, you know what I mean? And, and that I was uh, respected, you know? And that I took care of these people, and it cost them their dessert, and, you know, they used to do favors for me. I'll and society so. would ask you uh, to help you to correct you as far as the society. Society? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I don't know. It helped me all right. I guess I made Quentin afterward, and that helped me. The Duke uh, has graduated from preparatory school, presumably with honors. He's ready for the university. He can't fail to make it. He's been trained for it. Well, what, what was it that got you in San Quentin? Well, we used to do a lot of joy riding, you know. I mean, mm -hmm. we'd go out and pick up a car and ride around for a while. Find most cars had keys in them or what? No, man, we used to hot wire them, you see, like yeah. Fords, you know. Why they got a ignition set up where mm -hmm. you can stick a quarter or a nickel or something under there and it jumps the wires for you, see? Oh. Yeah. How many cars did you knock them? Well, see, one night, like, but you know where Compton is down yeah. there? Yeah. Well, from Compton to Long Beach, we took 23 cars one night. This is for the hell of it. Yeah, man, we used to drive them two or three blocks, you know, and we'd get mm -hmm. out and then we'd take another one, you see. How'd they catch you? Well, they didn't catch us on that particular caper there. Mm -hmm. I sold a couple, see, and they were sort of hot on me then, you know. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, a couple just, more drivers. How did you sell a car like that? Do you have the blue slip or picture well, No, see, we used to have a fence down there, you know. Oh, I see. Say, like, a car was worth maybe six, seven hundred dollars. We'd sell it for fifty or sixty, you know what I mean? Oh, I see. And then he'd file the engine number off and oh, I see. paint the car. Oh, yeah, record, record. Yeah. Uh, he, he made money. You guys didn't make money. He made the money more. Yeah, he made the loot, yeah. And we took the chance. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. Well, how did you, when you got knocked off and went to court, did the judge have much patience with you, or did you make San Quentin one big... You know what the judge told me, man? When I went to court, he says, no. he says, uh... Now, he says, I want you to look at yourself, he says. Mm -hmm. He says, I don't want you to think at a courtroom or the jury. He says, I want you to look at yourself. Mm -hmm. He says, you're 17 years old. He says, you've been in Camp 5. He says, you've been in Preston. He says, you've got nothing, you've got a record as long as my arm. He says, now, what, what kind of a life have you led? Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, he more or less just, he pulled, like my father would say, you know what I mean? He tore me down right in front of the whole thing, and I couldn't hardly protect myself, because whenever I started to say something, he'd tell me yeah. to shut up. You see what I mean? The quality of mercy is not strained. It is an attribute of God himself. And earthly power doth then show like us gods when mercy seasons justice.
What do you think of Quentin when he got there? Oh, man, that shook me up something <laughs> awful. I think everybody has it yeah. to say. You know what I mean? Like, uh, I don't know, it's it's hard to explain. Like, like guys used to tell me when they were in the war, you know, they'd, mm -hmm. they'd pile out of a, one of these little boats that used to pull yeah. up, you see, and, and man, here's all these guns and everything firing at them. See, well, we didn't have guns firing, man, but, I mean, you know, when you see them big gates and you see Q standing there, you figure, well, yeah. this is it, Jack. I mean, you know, this is, you've... You've you done had it, huh? Yeah, this is it. Well, uh, when you got inside there, how did you find the place that you got inside the walls out of the big yard and the people you met? Man, I, I mean, it surprised me. You know what it's like? It was like coming back to my neighborhood almost, you yeah. know what I mean? I met a lot of guys in it I knew, a lot of guys I graduated from Preston with. Yeah. And I met a lot of real fine people in there. Mm -hmm. I mean, people that uh, publicly are branded killers and yeah. so forth, you see. Do um, you have any special friends in there, or any special buddy you talked to, or anybody that helped you? Anybody? Did you get anybody there that kind of gave you a little yeah. stuff? Yeah. There was one guy that really helped me there. Who's that? That was Ben. You remember oh, yeah. Big Ben? Yeah, yeah, the mayor, yeah. Ben was all right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll tell How you. How was Ben anyway? Ben, he must be 54, 55. Yeah, he's up there. I know that. Yeah, he's, he'll Did die. Did tell you some of his experiences, huh? Yeah, he man. He, he told me about one... Well, it was the last caper he pulled, yeah. Oh, well, you want a daily meeting? Yeah, 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 that's right. Yeah. He was doing his bank job there. Yeah. And it seems that they, they pulled it off real nice. Mm-hmm. And as he was backing out of the bank with the loot, you see... Yeah. This, uh, this public-minded asshole... Imagine this. Comes up and grabs Ben when Ben's got the rod. Yeah. And he grabs him around the neck, see? Yeah. And he tells Ben, he says, he says, this is it. And he starts calling cop, cop, mm -hmm. cop. And so Ben tells him, listen, man, he says, I mean, I didn't hear this from Ben. I got it from one of the boys that was with him. It was also in cute. Mm -hmm. And Ben tells him, says, listen, man, I ain't got a lot of time to play games. He says, you let go of me. He says, I'm going to blow your head off, see? Mm -hmm. So what does the guy do? He keeps hanging on and he keeps hollering. And Ben tells him one more time the same thing, you know, I haven't got mm -hmm. much time, man. And the guy keeps hanging on and keeps hollering, see? So Ben turns around and he blows the guy's head off. Killed him right there, yeah, right in the spot. Um, um, and they got life, of course, on that, didn't they? Yeah, yeah, he got life on that. Well, how do you feel about that? Well, I don't know how Ben felt, but I felt it was a bad break for Ben. It really was. You know, but I mean, he was doing real well for himself, and then all of a sudden this guy... How about the poor guy got shot? What poor guy? He, <laughs> he was an asshole. A break for him, too, wasn't it? Well, I mean, he made his own break. You know, I mean, he, if you run up and you grab a guy <coughs> that's got a gun, man, yeah. I mean, you figure something's going to happen to you, right? I suppose so. So, I mean, let's face it, the guy was, uh, he, he was an asshole, that's all. Well, I mean, did you feel that the, the, the public would look that way? I mean, after all, the guy was trying to defend something he felt was wrong. I mean, he was well, uh, saving the money in the bank. Or... Well, uh, he didn't save no money. Mm -hmm. He didn't save nothing, man. He, in fact, he lost a lot. You see, he got his head blown off. I mean, Ben got away with the loot and spent it before they ever caught him. <laughs> you see? Well, I mean, his name is probably on a wall someplace or something, you know what I mean? Well, it was a bad break for Ben, it really was. Yeah. Thus, logic, as taught at San Quentin. There are other lofty subjects on the curriculum, philosophy and uh, morality, for instance. Well, how about when you stole, uh, I mean, you, you did a lot of heisting. I mean, do you ever feel guilty about it or bad about taking money from somebody? Or? Well, that's the way I look at it. I mean, like there used to be some kids, you know what I mean? They, they're in my block, see? Uh, and they had something, and I didn't have it, you know what I mean? Yeah. So I used to take it from them. Mm -hmm. Well, they could go home and get more, you see? Yeah. So, I mean, mm -hmm. did it hurt them any? Mm -hmm. No, I didn't hurt them. Only it, it taught them something, see, to stay yeah. away from me when they had something. Because if they did, I would take it, you know what I mean? They say we all have a conscience or it bothers us. Does it bother you? No, man, I don't I don't think it's people's conscience that bother them. What a conscience is, a conscience is fear, you see. A fear that you're going to get caught and have to do some yeah. time for it. You know, that's what a conscience is. You didn't is, have that fear, since the word, huh? No, man, I mean, you give that conscience shit. It, it ain't conscience, Dad. It's fear mm -hmm. of getting caught, believe mm -hmm. me. As far as Quentin, the guys you met in there, I mean, uh... Do you feel Quentin was an uh, experience for you? I mean, did you did you learn anything in there, since the word? Yeah, yeah, man, I learned a lot in there. I I learned that, uh, like Ben used to tell me, uh, if you're going to be a successful thief, play the game by yourself. You see what yeah. I mean? Mm -hmm. I mean, because you, I mean, you you can either squeal on yourself or that's it. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, that's right. I heard that. I heard that from yeah. you most the time. And I also learned, man, if you're going to ever pull something, you know, never with a gun or anything. You ever get the feeling you want to go back, something like a lot of guys do? They get, they get this feeling here, frustration. And yeah, man. Or you call it frustration. Call anything you want. I mean, a lot of times it hit me. Did you do hard time with John at all? Well, I done some hard time. You know, like how Christmas about cell time? How about your cell yeah, time? Yeah, cell time's bad time, man. I mean, around Christmas and so forth. Yeah. But. Listen, one thing, you know, like you, you can lay in a pad at night and you can yeah. say to your friend, you can say, listen, man, when I get out, I'm going to have me a new car and mm -hmm. I'm going to have me a fine broad and fine clothes, you know. Yeah. And I'm going to have money, you see. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can tell him that, you know what I mean? Yeah. And then he in turn can say to you, well, I'm going to have this or that. And you've yeah. got to believe one another because you're laying right there in a cell, yeah. you see. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a big dream, man, a dream yeah. that you build up while you're in there, you know what I mean? Well, you were better off there sometime you felt than you were outside? 
Yeah, in fact, I was a lot better off, you see, because mm -hmm. I had three squares and I had all the clothes I could wear. Yeah, this, oh, man, it wasn't a holiday, but here's the thing. I mean, in my particular case, there's a lot of guys that have done a lot of hard time. I, I was lucky I had it nice, you see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, I've had a lot nicer up there than I've had on the outside. It's like that at every educational institution. There are some students who stay on year after year who prefer the security of the campus to the doubtful opportunities of a hostile world. And this is especially true when the institution is a state penitentiary and the student is a marked man in the outside world. When I first got out, you know, we got, like, the unemployment office. They mm -hmm. have people, you know, to take care of and yeah, so on. So they send me out to a gas station, see? Mm -hmm. So I go out there and I say to the guy, I say, uh, I hear you need some help, see? Yeah. He says, yeah, that's right. He says, I need help real bad. He says, you have any experience? And I says, yeah, I, I had about uh, two and a half, three years experience. He says, where at? And I says, well, I says, I used to work in a pool up in San Quentin. He says, geez, he says, you know, he says, why, why don't you call back in about a week, he <laughs> says, or two weeks, you know? Possibly. Yeah, mm -hmm. the lousy <laughs> bastard, he, he had $20 in the till, you know what I mean? And he wanted yeah. to protect it. What shall we do now with Bobby, alias the Duke, graduate of San Quentin, philosopher, moralist, accomplished thief? Write him off as a bad risk? Forget him as a social failure? No. Let's listen to him for a moment more. I want to ask you about uh, something that everybody else has asked about and preaches about and writes about and has opinions about, this idea of doing a lot of latency. We see kids going in the joint more and more each day. The courts are going jail jam with yeah. kids. What do well, you think about it? Yeah, I'll tell you, you, you said it right there. They write about it and they preach about it and it's on television, yeah. it's on radio and it's on everything, man, but that's all they do, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You see? I mean, they don't do anything about it, you know? Yeah. Like you go down to my old neighborhood down in Watts, see, around yeah. Juniper Street, you know? Yeah. And, uh... Down there, what do they got down there? They got nothing, man. They ain't got a pot to piss in, see? Mm -hmm. But you go up to Beverly Hills, and here's some punk got a swimming pool in his backyard, and he got a sports car out in the front yard, and he's got bicycles for his little brothers and bicycles for yeah. his little sisters, you know? That's where they put a youth center, see? They don't mm -hmm. put it down in Juniper Street, you know what I mean? They put it up in Beverly Hills, see? I so, mean, they need it up there. Yeah. Well, how about these... Uh, you heard people say, well, I was raised in the I was kicked around when I was a kid. Uh, yet here I am, I'm making good money. I haven't gone to prison. Uh, how about people like, you have the big success story, Winchell, Eddie King. Yeah, 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 Walter Winchell, like yeah. Like Jolson. Yeah, I heard, yeah, I heard. Who were in the slums? Who knew mm -hmm. the worst of the slums? Yeah, yeah, let's see. Now, let me think now. Walter Winchell, and Eddie Cannon, and, uh, who, oh, yeah, Al Jolson, you names, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, well, that's three, see? Now, man, I can name, I can name 400 right here in five minutes yeah. that are still in the joint, that were raised in the slum. You see what I mean? I mean, you name three, and I can name three well, million that didn't make it. You think it's environment, it. the streets, the, the, the way we're born, that makes a difference? Or what? Sure, man, because you ain't never got a chance. You see mm -hmm. what I mean? If you take a little white boy named Smith, and then you take a little colored boy named Smith, I mean, that little white boy's gonna get much more breaks. You mm -hmm. see, man? I mean, like a lot of kids in my neighborhood, their folks were from Oklahoma, so, so therefore they're Okies, you see? Yeah. Or maybe their mother or father's colored, you know? So therefore they're niggers, you see what I mean? The public don't give them a chance, man. What would you advise a kid nowadays growing up? Would you tell them to try and go straight if it Listen, man, it, it isn't if the kid can go straight, it's if the public will give him a chance, you see what I, I mean? See, yeah. It's if the public will give him a chance. Well, will you? The forger who interviewed the Duke is still writing. Not bad checks anymore, but radio and television scripts. And the Duke is still interested in motors, especially the motor of the beer truck he's driving to support himself and his young bride. Both men have paid their debt to society, to the public. Will the public give them a chance? Only time, and you, can tell. The CBS Radio Workshop has presented I Was the Duke, a portrait of a juvenile delinquent with William Keneally as narrator and produced in Hollywood by William N. Robeson. Next week, from New York, the workshop brings you The Big Event, an account of the fateful day in the history of man when the law of averages stopped operating. Every Sunday evening, current events come into sharper focus as prominent Washington personalities are interviewed by a battery of top-flight reporters on the CBS public affairs feature, Face the Nation. Here, Face the Nation, over most of these same stations tonight. Stay tuned for Suspense, which follows immediately over most of these same stations. <laughs>